Today's episode deals with many mature topics, including suicide, unwed pregnancies, and abortion. Listener discretion is advised. So I'm 15, alone and scared out of my wits. I did not know what in the world was going to happen to me. I woke up and I'm still in the delivery room and they told me it was a boy and that I uh, could not see him. I'm Paul Hastings and you're listening to Compelled, a weekly podcast with unique stories from the kingdom of God told by the people compelled to live for him. In our last regular episode, we heard from Joe Friedman, who was a devoted Jew for most of his life, but after attending a cult meeting, was so unsettled by their depiction of Jesus, decided to read a Christian Bible for the first time, and eventually came to Christ. If you missed that episode, you can find it on our website, compelledpodcast.com. Our guest today, though, is Kathy Brace. Her story of redemption is so rich that we've actually split it into two different episodes, and this is part one. Kathy spent much of her life looking for true love, chasing after her dream of a picture-perfect family. Yet over and over again, she only found bitterness and rejection. Kathy's life trajectory was on a downward spiral that appeared to be completely hopeless until the source of true hope appeared. That story coming up right after a word from today's sponsor. This episode of Compelled is brought to you by Patriot Academy. Patriot Academy raises up leaders with a biblical worldview that boldly champion the cause of freedom and truth through government. Patriot Academy holds intense week-long trainings at state capitals around the nation, and attendees learn about the legislative process by participating in a mock legislature, filing and debating bills and policies, and all the while, they learn fundamental principles and truths. I actually attended Patriot Academy a few years ago in Texas, and it was an incredible experience. I got to sit at the same desk and debate on the same floor as actual Texas legislators. I made close friends and learned important character traits. But most importantly, I saw firsthand the desperate need we have as Christians to engage the culture and not shrink away. Patriot Academy holds events every year for young adults ages 16 to 25, as well as a citizen track and a military veterans track. Their academies are held all across America, and there's a good chance one of them will be near you. Compelled listeners can receive $25 off tuition by using the promo code COMPELLED. Learn more at PatriotAcademy.com. Again, you can learn more at PatriotAcademy.com. My wife and I met with Kathy Brace about a month ago at her house in Wichita, Kansas. The neighborhood she lives in today is peaceful and quiet, the exact opposite of what her life was like growing up in Memphis, Tennessee. When I was born, my mom had gone through a pretty traumatic birth with my brother. Hmm. My dad showed up at the hospital very drunk, Hmm. made a scene. It was so embarrassing for her. And the hospital actually kicked him out. Oh, wow. So... She was not planning on having any more children. In the back of her mind, she had hoped that things would work out, but it was looking bad already with my brother. But she stuck it out, and no birth control back in those days, and she got pregnant again. And as soon as she found out, she said, I will never let him know that we're going when I go to the hospital. So January 16th, 1950, my mom caught a bus and rode it about 30 minutes downtown and told no one and walked into the labor and delivery room and I was born. Wow. Yeah. Wow. They um, came to ask her what she was going to name me, and she looked my doctor, her doctor, square in the eyes and said, I really don't care. You name her. Hmm. Yeah, I was hard hearing that story a few times growing up, but he was rather taken back by it. He loved his wife. Her name was Kathy. 
And he said, well, my wife's name's Kathy, and her middle name is Ann. That's how I got my name. So your doctor named you? My doctor named me. Wow. My mom was a piano inspector. Okay. So she worked a lot. She worked all the time. She worked daytime, and she worked at night. She would take in ironing, whatever it took to bring in money. So I didn't have her around a lot. We had a sitter, or we had my, my aunt that lived close. She worked so hard. I just remember her leaving early, coming home late, ironing, cleaning, cooking. No conversation. Mm. No conversation. It just didn't happen in our home. We, My brother... We'd get in trouble every now and then for horsing around. I was very quiet, very withdrawn, and I never got in trouble. Quiet Kathy. While Kathy grew up with a mom who was very detached, the situation with her dad was even worse. My dad was a very severe alcoholic. Um, he was in and out of the home for many years. He always went to the same joint, really close to International Harvester, which is the only place he worked for more than six months. He'd stop there after work, spend all the money. Hmm. So it became a normal routine thing for the three of us to get in the car and drive to the hole in the wall, was the name of it. The Dirt the floor. The name of the bar. The name of the bar. Literally. That's the name of it. My mom would send my brother in to roll him. And what do you mean by roll him? Explain that for us. Get the money out of his pocket. Okay. Find the check. If we were lucky. That's how it went. And I I remember very clearly one night him coming home. And he, he was very drunk and came in and was yelling at my mom, screaming at my mom, give me my money back. My brother heard it and goes running out to defend. That's my brother, the defender, protector, running out and hitting him. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Well, that was not good because, of course, my dad took it out on him. My brother started running and to slam the door to the bedroom, but of course my dad was right stumbling all over the place on behind him, and he smacked him, backhanded him right onto the floor. And my brother wanted better shot at him, I guess, jumped up on the bed and went after him. And I am hiding under the bed watching the whole thing. And just seeing my brother hit the mattress, come back up on his feet, bam, again. It was horrible. No five-year-old should see anything like that. It was awful. My mom decided that it was just too dangerous to have him around, and she asked him to leave. All of her family told her she should put us up for adoption, that she could not deal with raising two children alone. And that was the wrong thing to say to her because she would do whatever it took to prove that she could and she could do it well. And from a financial standpoint and from keeping us clean and clothed and fed, she did that. But it it came with a cost. She was not present because she was so busy working all the time. Mm. That was how she was raised. You work hard your whole life. You work hard, you can afford nice things. And that was her goal Mm. for both of us. Kathy watched her mom cope with life by hiding problems and putting on a front for the outside world. Everything was about appearances. That included not talking about your feelings or showing weakness. Kathy learned from her mom to never acknowledge pain, but instead to ignore it. And with this self-help attitude, there was no need for God. Didn't go to church. 
that didn't happen. Uh, I recall a couple of times going for Easter because I would get a new dress and a hat and gloves and shoes and purse. So, hey, (laughs) can't beat that. Yeah. So she would take us on Easter and I loved it. But I loved it for the wrong reasons. I loved it because I got a new dress. I got to play dress up with myself. Yeah. My aunt lived very close, so I was always able to go down and visit them. My aunt, Cokie, and Uncle Jim lived right around the corner, and I spent a lot of hours there. They had five children, and that's where I found my peace. That's where I found someone who would take me and give me a big old hug, sit down at the table, and talk to me. I'll never forget those days of her doing that for me. Apart from her aunt and uncle, Kathy only experienced rejection, something that made her crave relationships and acceptance even as a young child. Growing up in such a dysfunctional family left a deep mark on Kathy and triggered many years of looking for love in all of the wrong places. When I started school, which was in walking distance, of course, I tried really hard to be a good student. But the older I got, the more withdrawn I got. Until I hit the third grade and my teacher, right in front of everyone in the room, said, if you don't get your act together, you're going to end up just like your dad. Mm. And it was so embarrassing. Oh, man. It was, I was mortified. I didn't even know that she knew, much less understand it all myself. The next two years, I really struggled. I didn't want to do well in school. I just became very distracted, constantly looking at the other families that had a whole family unit. I became obsessed with it. Mom and dad, mom and dad, children. And... I remember one day when my friend Pam wanted to come over and play at my house and stay over on Friday. So she had asked her mom early in the week, and she came back and said, well, I can't. You don't have a daddy in your home. Well, I was like, my mom's there? Because she was. She was there physically, and it hurt. Um, that would have been in the sixth grade. In the seventh grade, you go to high school. No junior high. Yeah. So in seventh grade, I'm going into a very large high school, 800 in each class. And that's when guys started showing me attention until one of my brother's not very good friend, asked me to go out. And we started dating, and all of his friends had girlfriends, and they would always end up at the park. I didn't like that, but I went along because that's what I did then. Quiet Kathy went along, shy Kathy, and... They started making fun of us, and me especially. What's wrong with you? You have a boyfriend now. Putting a lot of pressure on us to drink, which I did not want to do. I had seen what that had done to my dad. Yeah. And what it had done to other family members, and I did not want to do that. But after so much pressure that I allowed in, Friday night became drinking night. The more you drink, the less you are aware of what's going on, of course. And in January, we went to a huge New Year's Eve party with Lester. That was his name. And we drank a lot. And unbeknownst to me at that moment, got pregnant. I 
I will say that when I made that choice with Lester, there was a voice in my head that said, don't do this, you're going to regret it. And I heard it often, but when you don't pay attention to that little voice that's speaking inside of you, and you squash it every time you hear it, it gets harder to hear. Eventually, Kathy began to suspect in horror that she might be pregnant. I continued school for several more weeks, getting sicker and sicker as time went on, not believing that I was pregnant. I was running to the bathroom, throwing up, realized I wasn't having my cycle. And, but I just, there was no way to check. You have to go to a doctor back then to check. You don't, there's no pregnancy test that you buy. And that wasn't going to happen. The first thing the doctor would do is tell my mom, and that wasn't, wasn't going to happen. I just thought it's going to go away. Hmm. I'm not. It wouldn't happen to me. It couldn't happen to me. I'm too young. And I tried every way under the sun to hide it. I refused to go to gym class because back then you had to wear these skimpy little gray rompers. Ridiculous. So I hid it. And I did hide it really well up until I hit the five-month mark, and then it started getting hard. Right around the time I figured it out, he moved on to another girlfriend. Hmm. How old are you? Fifteen. At this point, Kathy started panicking. The longer she tried to hide the fact that she was pregnant, the more difficult it became. She tried starving herself so the baby wouldn't show. She stole a girdle from a department store and tried wearing it. She became erratic and impulsive, and at one point even threw herself out of a moving car. Anything to mask the pain. Finally, at the end of the year, my mom sent me to stay with some of our friends in eastern Tennessee. We always did every year. That was her two-week vacation. But I got to go for two extra weeks that year. And that was my mom's plan because she did suspect, sent me there to get it out of me. And as soon as they did, she came and got me brought home. Well, no, they brought me home hmm. and sat me down in the living room and said, I know you're pregnant. We're leaving tomorrow. We're going to Texas and you're giving the baby up for adoption. Hmm. It's very overwhelming. I had not told the dad because he was off. He was gone, and I wasn't about to pull him back with the threat of pregnancy. I would never do that. Kathy felt shocked and betrayed. This was not what she expected when she made the fateful decision to give herself away to Lester. And sure enough, the next morning we got in the car with a couple of her friends and drove to Abilene, Texas. We stopped at the adoption agency first. There we went over all the legalities. And then they took me to the home for unwed mothers, which is, by the way, very common back then. That's how it worked. They had maternity homes all over America for women girls without husbands yeah and how many months pregnant were you at biden now i'm six months six months pregnant mm -hmm. it was a duplex and the driveway to the duplex was wide and long it was so hot then because it was texas and june and it was miserable my mom gets out of the car her friend's husband gets out of the car. They open up the trunk, get my luggage out. It wasn't much. It was just one piece. I had no maternity clothes, nothing. Didn't know what it meant to be pregnant, really. Except I was so sick. I fainted constantly. I, I was so weak from not eating. I was in bad shape. So they took my suitcase and set it on the driveway and said, I'll see you when you get home. 
So I picked it up and went inside and met everybody, which was really weird because there was about nine girls there. Five of them were married. They were all much older than me. I was surprised by that. I thought, am I the only child here? (laughs) I felt like a child. Why were the married women there? They didn't want their babies. They had had a, two of them had had an affair and they didn't want their husbands to know. So I don't know how they pulled that one off. Hmm. I don't really know about the others. And the, there was uh, the big room in the back that was like a dorm room that had several beds. There was another bedroom that had two beds. And then my bedroom had one bed. It was isolation again. And, and you were 15. I was 15. <clears throat> so they pulled out their extra maternity clothes, which was really funny because they made me look so big. Yeah. Smocking. Oh, boy. Anyway, so I had two maternity tops, a required maternity dress, and a pair of maternity crop pants, we call them now. They were called pedal pushers back then. And that was my wardrobe. And the the man that brought um, all of us out there, he gave me $10. So I had 10 bucks in my hand at that point. Wow. No cell phone, and long distance was way too expensive for my mom. Who was I going to call anyway? I wasn't about to call the dad. But they would call me once in a while to see how things were going. Kathy's mother had effectively abandoned her with complete strangers. She had no real friends and felt totally isolated. And for the next three months, Kathy had nothing to do except wait. The only thing that broke the monotony was Sunday morning. The requirement was that on Sunday morning, you must go to church. If you don't agree to that, you cannot stay here and you have to wear a dress. So Sunday morning, it's hard to remember back on that. It's really tough. We piled all of the women into the church van. We went to church and it was a very large church. But the back pews were always reserved for us. So we prayed in, take our seat, prayed back out. Never were spoken to. Oh, man. Never. It was like we had the plague. Or the person sitting up on the row in front of you could be taking your baby. You did not know. Oh, my goodness. After three long months of waiting, Kathy received an unexpected phone call. My mom called and said, Kathy, you've got to have the baby. If you don't get back home before school starts, you can't get in. I'm like, well, <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? I'm all for it. What, how do I do that? Go to the drugstore, buy castor oil, mix it with orange juice, and down it. Okay, Mom. Thought to myself then, what's that going to do? And not only did I buy one bottle, but I bought two. And I took both bottles. All eight ounces? Mm Mm-hmm. All down. Down the hatch. Ate crackers after because I almost threw up. It's a lot of oil to drink drink at one time. And that's eight ounces. That's way overkill. You should not do eight ounces. I found out it causes very bad side effects. But it worked. That afternoon, actually, I started cramping. And I wasn't sure what that even felt like or what it meant. No classes, no teaching, no books, nothing. So I went to the mother, the the mom that was staying there to take care of us, and said, I don't feel very good, and I have problems. And I hurt, and I showed her that, and I said, "My, my belly's getting very hard. And she looked at me and said, well, you're in labor. Let's go. Pack your bag. 
I wanted to say what bag, but I did. And off we went to the hospital. <laughs> that was an adventure. Hmm. Hard to bring that one back, too. Yeah. So she took me in and checked me in and left. So I'm 15, alone and scared out of my wits. I did not know what in the world was going to happen to me. It was a very traumatic delivery, two days alone. Two days. Um, the house mom would come back once a day and would rub my back. And I would beg her to stay, but she had to get back and take care of the other girls. And after all, I was in a hospital, so I've been taken care of. The nurses were cold and they shamed me, you might say, scolded me. Hmm. The birth, after the two days of labor, the <clears throat> they took me back to the delivery room and I thought okay they're going to take care of this now because it was a very difficult two days and the doctor was already gowned up gloved up mask on and everything they put me on the table and the nurse started to strap down my arm and I just went lost it I thought no this isn't part I'm not doing that so she tried to calm me down and tell me it was going to be okay, that I would go to sleep if I would cooperate. I said, well, okay, if I'm going to go to sleep. But then she just strapped down both arms, both legs, and I, this was all before, and so I just started fighting it. And I got, she was putting on the second one, and I just got away from it and was I was going to run from that place. I did not know what was going to happen to me. So the doctor started screaming at the nurse to get me under control, and I'm screaming. It, it was chaos. And you're still in labor while this is going oh, yeah. on. Yeah. So she did force me down. She laid on top of me. She put the mask on, and I hear the doctor saying, strap her with her arm. I don't know that they ever did got around to doing that, but the gas did start helping, and I went to sleep. Hmm. So no one, no one explained to you no. what was going to happen, how to deliver a baby. There, no. You're just this 15 year old kid. Yes. No explanation of anything. I mean, it, it was ridiculous when I think back about it. I woke up and I'm still in the delivery room, and I said, "Where's my baby? Where's my baby?" Because I knew something had happened. And he said, they've taken the baby to the nursery. Well, of course, my first thing is, I want to see it. What did I have? And they told me it was a boy and that I uh, could not see him. The laws back then were very different. You do, you do not have rights. Once you sign that paper, which you cannot sign until after you have the baby, you can do preliminary legal stuff, but the actual adoption paper must be assigned, signed afterwards. So that's where my stubborn nature showed itself, and I refused. I wanted to see him. I wanted to hold him. I wanted some time with him. I just felt like everything had been taken away from me. No choices in anything. And this was not going to go by without me having that opportunity. The nurses are coming in every day. You can't see the baby. It's too hard. You'll never forget about it. Get on with your life. Move on. You'll be haunted. Everything you can think of to convince me. And the next thing I know, my mom's calling Kathy, you're causing trouble, and you're being stubborn. If you do not do this, the baby cannot be given up for adoption. You're going to have to raise this baby alone. In my mind, I'm going. Processing, processing. 
Mom, tell them to let me see the baby, and I promise to sign it. She knew I meant it, and they did. They brought him into the room, all bundled up, and put him in my arms and said, you have two hours. So that's how I spent that that next two hours, just saying, telling him everything I could possibly think of, examining him, because I had done some dangerous things when I was pregnant, and I just wanted to make sure I did not harm him in any way. So I'm looking everything over, and he was so healthy, bright blue eyes, blonde hair, exactly like his dad. Hmm. And they came back after the two hours, and they took him. And I signed the papers. I was dismissed, like, just a few hours later. Giving her son up for adoption was a haunting decision. Kathy couldn't stop thinking about what she had done and who she had left behind. I was so broken. Ashamed. Yeah. Hopeless. Who's ever going to want me now? That was what went on in my head 24 hours a day. Getting on the plane to go home was like I had left a piece of myself behind. I know that's cliche, but it's true. I had left a piece of my heart, a big piece, in Abilene, Texas. And I knew I would never see him again. And I remember the plane ride home just thinking, move on, move on, you can move on. I'd heard that so many times that I began to believe it. And and did you have a, did you and your mom like really talk about the fact that you'd been pregnant? Did y'all, I mean, because it seems like you went to Eastern Tennessee, she found out that you're pregnant, that family brought you back, and it seems like immediately she then took you to Abilene. So, like, y'all really never Oh, no. I wasn't allowed this. to. When I came home from Abilene, I longed to just tell her what happened, the birth, and how, how awful it was, and how alone I felt. And what was going to happen to him? What's going to happen to me? And she made it very clear that that was behind me. We would not discuss it. It's over. It's behind you. We're not going to talk about that again. Mm-hmm. You're going to get on with your life now and make better choices. At this stage, like during the whole pregnancy and the adoption and coming back, did you did you think about God during this point? Did you think did, did, was that even just a deserted? There, God would not. There's not. Can't be a God. Why would He let this happen to me? I don't believe what you're saying. I got a really bad attitude. I just didn't feel like He was there. Ever the loneliness, the desertion. I just became hard, very hard-hearted, and extremely rebellious. At that point in my life, I really didn't care what happened. Yeah. So uh, by the time I get home, the first thing my mom says is, well, you can't go back to school. They won't let you. I'm like, why? Why? I thought if I made it back, I'm back before it starts. She said, they know you're pregnant. And I'm like immediately, well, that was a failure. Because at this point, you tried to keep the whole pregnancy a a secret? Like no no one knew? No one knew. My friend, the friends in eastern Tennessee, my mom, my aunt knew. But they figured it out. And, of course, I was the only kid, literally, that had gotten pregnant at school that year. But they had it in place because it was obviously had happened before. It was their rule in the Memphis school board. If you get pregnant, you may not return to school for one year. So mom said, 
you've got a couple of weeks to settle in, but then we have to go. You're going to live with your granny and Potik. That's my dad's parents. You're going to live with them and go to school with your cousins. Banished again. Even though Kathy moved schools and changed her friends, her heart was still the same. She was angry, rebellious, and still desperately looking for love. But she was looking for it in all the wrong places. So I finished the 10th grade, and I had a friend that was going to get married. We were we were pretty good friends, and she wanted, Barbara wanted me to go with them to get married. She said, but before we go, I want you to go out with this, his best friend. I'm like, sure. So we went out and we hit it off. And on the second time, this is really embarrassing. He said, we should get married. We hit it off great. I'm thinking, you out of your mind. He persisted. He was Sicilian, very talkative, very funny. I thought it was a joke. He was not kidding. I wanted to escape. There's nothing I wanted more than to be out of my house. So I said, oh, I'll go with you guys, but that's not happening. I'm 16. I can't get married. And he said, well, actually, you can. We're going to go to Florence, Alabama, and it's three hours. All you have to do is get a blood test, wait three hours, and you're married. I said, I'm 16. That can't happen. Go home, get your birth certificate, and bring it back. He forged it. We went to, we drove, did the blood test, lied like crazy, and I come home married. (laughs) Ma. Desperation. How did you break the news to your mom that you're now married? Like, (laughs) I called her. And told her, and she, she took it pretty well, her typical way. Oh, okay. Who is it? I told her. Okay, well, we'll have a shower for you. A shower? What's that? And she did have pictures of it. Hmm. What began as a spur of the moment decision, fueled by rebellion and the promise of freedom turned out to have grave consequences. It only took me a couple of weeks to realize that I'd married my dad. He was a drunk. His dad was a drunk. His dad was, believe it or not, in the mafia. Hmm. And the the gambling side of it, that's why they moved to Memphis, so they could do the gambling there across the river. Mm -hmm. And... He had a lot of friends. They loved to party. And one night he came and started yelling at me, pushing me around. His friends started pushing me around, kind of like a, I'm like this little bouncy clown ball in the middle of the room and you take a punch at it and it falls one way and another punch, another punch. They're laughing, they're very drunk. I escaped that and ran to the bedroom and called my brother. And I said, I need you. Please come get me. They're banging on the door. They're screaming and yelling. And I really felt like I had failed the greatest failure ever at that point. And I had just fallen in a heap on the floor and just thought it was over. Mom, what was my mama going to say? And will she let me come home? He, I heard a lot of noise going on, and I was crying, and I was trying to throw things in a bag so I could get out of there, and I knocked over this box that had a gun in it. And it's sounding like there's going to be a big old fight out in the other room. And I just picked up that gun and said, well, I'm going to be, this is the end of that. So I'm thinking I'm going to go out there and 
you know, take care of the situation. Not really. I didn't even know what, I never held a gun in my life, ever. Never touched one, didn't know what it looked like, how to hold it, what it did. But when I opened the door, there was a lot of yelling and screaming going on. It scared me out. My brother is just, he's mad. Close the door, pick up the gun, and say, well, I'm going to end this. And I tried to kill myself, but I the gun wouldn't go off because I didn't know it had a safety until I finally accidentally figured it out and it went off, but it went off through the, in the house and out the wall to the outside, which got my attention. God knows what he's doing there. He wasn't ready for me to check out at that point. And of course that got their attention and they're all screaming and yelling and coming down and beating the door down and my brother grabbed me and picked me up and he took me home and my mom let me stay. But I was pregnant. In retrospect, Kathy realizes it was a miracle that she left the house alive that night. But at the time, she had other things on her mind. Kathy ended up getting a divorce, and she had to decide what to do about the baby on the way. There was no way anyone would ever take that baby away from me. Ever. I was determined, and my mother knew it, and if I told her, if she even thought about mentioning it, I'd leave and I'd figure it out. But she didn't. She let me stay, and uh, I had Erica, my daughter, Erica, the oldest, my oldest daughter. Loved being a mom. I didn't want to take care of her and work so much that the same thing happened to her. And that became the purpose of my life. Be the mom that I never had. Mm. And I spent all of my time with her. But also I felt like I needed to provide for her. I began to think that the only way I was going to get myself out of this mess is to find another a husband. Because the thing I did not want was for my children to be raised by a single mom. I couldn't plague their life with that because that's how I had it. So I began to think, I'm going to get married. And we would be a happy family, complete family, mom, dad, children my pursuit in life. So once again, Kathy began dating, this time looking for someone that might make a good husband. But without God in her life, the power of the world was still overwhelming. I met a guy that had his own place, seemed to have his act together, full-time job, treated me nice. And his name was Johnny, and we started dating and... Lo and behold, I got pregnant again. And the first thing in my mind was, there's no way. And when I told him, he said, get out, don't want it, don't want anything to do with it. You're on your own. Hmm. So my mom, bless her heart, I, I held it off for a very long time. And didn't tell her, of course, that's my way I do things. Don't tell. Keep it a secret. Life is a secret. But I did finally tell her, and I told her, I think, Mama, I'm going to have to do this again. I'm going to have to give this baby up for adoption. So I hid myself out with Eric and I, stayed with her every day. We just became so close and never left the house cleaned and cooked and did all the things for my mom and then it came time to go into that I went into labor one night and it was terrifying my mom drops me off as is her routine and says call me when it's over and 
I walk in, hadn't checked in, hadn't seen a doctor. And, of course, I'm in labor, and they take me in, and I was progressing a lot at that point, and they weren't going to kick me out. And they gave me twilight sleep because I was throwing a fit. I woke up. Mom came to pick me up. I had Amy in my arms, little bitty thing. You, you named your daughter Amy. Amy. The, the third one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we drove over to the Catholic Children's Home and walked inside and told them the situation. So again, I leave my baby and walk away, go home to Erica and just terribly broken. And, and, and what did... Like, what was going through your heart when you left Amy behind? Failure. Such a failure. Hopeless. Ruining my life over and over again, making the same mistake over and over again. Defeat. Defeated. That's the best word right there. Hopeless. Yeah. Hopeless. Kathy had done what she had promised herself she would never do again. She left another baby behind. And once again, she turned to another relationship to soothe the pain. So I went home and tried to pursue my life of finding a good man instead of always choosing the bad ones. And that didn't work. Um... At my job, I had met someone, and he played football for the Oakland Raiders. He was in Memphis going to school, dental school. That's what he was going to do when he finished. And once again, I got pregnant. Uh, As we're seeing each other, he says, by the way, I'm married, when I told him. I had no idea. We, we went out in public. Again, Kathy was pregnant out of wedlock. And as her life continued spiraling out of control, she turned to a terrible recourse, abortion. I didn't even know that that was possible. And he said, no, you can, you can have that done for $200 here. Gave me $200. I took the money and I left and tried to find out who this, where to go, how to do this, and I could not believe I had to drive into Dyersburg, which is right there where my family, my grandparents, lived just outside of Dyersburg. The grandparents who used to take you to church? That, that I stayed with. I, I mean, right downtown is where my grandparents worked, in Dyersburg. And, I thought, I'm going to have to sneak in and sneak out. I was terrified that they would, someone would see me. And I was alone, and I drove in, and oh my word, this building was painted dark brown, shrubs everywhere, could barely find the door. I parked a block away, not knowing, didn't want someone to see my car, for one, and kind of hide myself to to go in. It was cold, and I was able to cover myself up enough. And I probably was only maybe eight or ten weeks along. So I walk in the front door, and this really old lady is standing there, and she said, because I had made an appointment, and, do you have the money? Yes, ma'am. I slipped her the $200 and go into this back room, take off your clothes, and then I'll come get you. They took me back, metal table, put me to sleep. It was over. I got up as fast as I could and 
literally slumped down into the uh, the car seat and didn't really want to even think about it. I just put that car in drive and headed straight down 51 back to Memphis and blocked it. Just completely blocked it. And literally no one knew. My mom didn't know, no friend, no one, except the father. And I had truly given up at that point. And I went back home and I just hid. I just stayed with Erica all the time and hid. And after the abortion, I got a severe infection, ended up having major surgery, and I was in recovery from that. The doctor said I'd probably never have more children, which devastated me. And wanted to know what in the world had happened to me. Kathy's goal of having the perfect family was in tatters. No matter how many relationships she tried, none of them worked out. At that point, I was bitter. And I said, I will never, ever be with another man. I am done. And... A friend from that lived in my area, a really good friend, actually, said, well, she kept saying, Kathy, you just can't give up. There's more out there. They're not all horrible people. Not all men are that evil. And I just thought about my Uncle Jim and thought, no, they're not. Is there one like him? Eventually, Kathy was introduced to Mike, who seemed to be different. After much persistence, she finally agreed to go on a date. So I agreed, but I was determined. I was rude. I was so rude. So I thought, first night, I'm going to test this out. Where would you like to go? The drive-in. I'm sure he's thinking, really? You want to go to the drive-in? Okay, where do, what do you want to see? Didn't matter. Went to the drive-in, and I was determined to test this guy to see what he was made of. So we get there, and I said, I'm hungry. Very blunt, to the point. I listed off everything I could think of, from hot dogs, pizza, pickle, ice cream, Coke, you name it. He's going laughing. Whoa, you have an appetite. You're feeling better, I take it. I'll be right back. So he goes, brings it all back, and he says, I'll go back and get the ice cream, but I didn't want it to melt while you're having your feast here. (laughs) And I said, but I was going to eat that first. Obstinate. I was so rude. Oh, okay. So, never mind. So, I'm just being the rudest person on the planet and just wiping my mouth with the back of my hand. No manners, which I'm a Southern person. We have manners. And the second show is starting, and I said, go get the ice cream. So, he goes and gets the ice cream, comes back, and I'm eating the ice cream and chugging down the pop. (laughs) This is terrible. So the second show, he does whatever guy's going to do that I've ever known. And I knew it was coming. So he slips his arm around me, and I turn my head right in his face and let out the biggest belch (laughs) you've ever heard. was disgusting. Yeah. Well, he laughed. He thought it was funny. And things went on from there. We started seeing each other on a regular basis. and So you didn't scare him off then? I did not scare him off, actually. And But he, he was stubborn, too. 
And his instinct of conquer started coming out because I was cold hearted. I wouldn't kiss him. I wouldn't hold his hand. Nothing. I made sure that Erica was, you know, always included as many times as possible. And he appeared to have it together. He was uh, going to to Memphis State to finish his degree, working a full-time job. And, of course, he started pressuring me. He was divorced. He had married his high school sweetheart, Hmm. and that didn't work out. And he ran from that situation. He got an emergency divorce and was out of there in two months. Hmm. It's kind of unheard of, but he did it. Um, And at this point, like? No God anywhere. Nothing. So you were just doing, this is what you thought people did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. I was determined. Is that a ring on my finger? You're not going to come near me. So I said, either we get married or you're you're gone. He said, let's get married. And I said, okay. I mean, it wasn't quite that blunt, but it. It almost was. Kathy was now married for the second time. She and Mike moved to Wichita, Kansas, and quickly had two girls in a row. For the first time, Kathy was having children on purpose and with a father that actually wanted them. And for once, it seemed like her dream of having the perfect family might work out. But slowly, that dream began to crumble. She and Mike had brought a lot of personal baggage into the marriage, and they began fighting incessantly, and the strain of raising three young girls was taxing. Eventually, they realized that their marriage had stopped working. Something had to change. That's when Kathy had an idea. Maybe church would fix all of their problems. After all, her Aunt Cokie and Uncle Jim had been churchgoers. If it worked for them, maybe it would work for Kathy and Mike, too. So Kathy brought it up to Mike. So he he agreed right away that, yeah, we can try it. Because we both did not want to admit that we had failed. Two very strong, stubborn people, that was not going to happen. So we started going to church there, and we went for several months. And just, you know, once a, on Sunday, and I started seeing that there were people there that were really genuine, nice. They talked to me. They cared about us. They would call during the week, and they were getting ready to have a vacation Bible school, so school was getting out, and I thought, okay, we'll take the girls. But I had been going to church there. They thought I had it all together. Because that is what we do in our family. We have an appearance that everything is perfect on the outside. Mm -hmm. You put your little plastic smile on, your perfect clothes, hair, everything always looks perfect. And the pastor at that time was getting ready to leave. So just a few months later, a new pastor comes on. And they're having a revival. And at the revival, I learned things. I really listened. I went every night. And every morning, they had a morning group for the women. So I would go at night, and I'd go at morning, go at night. So by Wednesday, I'm hearing things at this morning group for women that I've never heard before. Like what? One thing was they talked about having peace with God, that God loves you, and that there is nothing in the world you can do to not have God's love. I mean, they're just talking about all this stuff I've never heard before in my life. I don't even know who God is. And how... 
Jesus died so that I, Kathy, could have a hope. Well, I wasn't quite sure what the hope part meant, but by back of my mind, I'm going, hope for my marriage, hope for my children, and they're going, that's what they were started talking about. If you're having marriage problems, there is hope. If you find your way with the Lord and in His Word, you can have the hope that you can get through that. They said it in different terms, but that's, I would take little snippets and put the picture together. So Thursday, I'm going, I think I need to have that new pastor over. And my Mike's cousin, Paula, was not a Christian, and she had been going all the time with me. She says, yeah, Kathy, we really need to have him come over and talk. So Thursday morning, after the Bible study, he came over and laid out very clearly how a person can find hope. And he laid out the whole plan right there in front of me and said, Kathy, you have made some mistakes. We all have. But that's why Jesus came, so mm-hmm. that you could be forgiven and have a new life with him, with hope. That was it. When he said, with him, with hope, after hearing a lot of things during the week, I thought, I very quietly said, I, I want that. I don't, how do you do that? And he explained um, how to pray, how to ask God, how to confess, how to repent, and what it meant to repent. Well, my Paula just immediately jumps off the couch, gets on her knees, and starts pouring out her whole life very quickly. Just, I'm like, what are you doing? And I'm just listening to her, and her heart was really breaking. And I'm quiet, just very quiet, really thinking things through. Is this really the truth? Yeah. And I knew. I knew it was, but I didn't say a word. And they left, and that night, I, I just, God was really on my mind and my heart. And I, I had heard things that gave me hope. And I, everything in my past just flashed by. I, I can't. I'm too dirty. There's not good there. How could he clean this up? Not only did I, I cussed like a sailor, I smoked, I had done some drinking, I'd had, I'd had an abortion. I am too far gone. So I called the pastor back and I asked him to come back over after the night, Thursday nights. And he just prayed for me. He just, he didn't say a word. He just prayed for me. And it was during that very sweet prayer, he knew that the struggle was very difficult for me and and that I did feel like I was not worthy. And his prayer was just so genuine, so kind and loving and hopeful that I just started bawling and thinking, well, maybe there is something to salvage here. And I just, at that point, just broke down and gave up as best I could, not knowing much at that time, and just felt clean. That I had been cleansed of that and that I, there was hope. No, hope really wasn't for me that I longed for, that I, all the, up to this point, it was for my family. But then it became hope for me. I was born again on that day, and there is no question in my mind about it. 
Kathy's story of redemption is so powerful. After so much hopelessness and desperate searching for love and acceptance in the world, Kathy had finally found true love and acceptance at the cross. Now, believe it or not, this is only the first half of Kathy's story. Even though she had found Christ, there was still a long journey in front of her, including trusting God with her marriage, which was still on the rocks, a life-altering accident that debilitated much of her body, and in one of the most unique twists, God began using Kathy, who had given away two of her own children and aborted a third to begin delivering babies at birth. You'll hear all of that and more in part two next Tuesday. And if you listen through the credits, we'll play you a sneak peek. If you don't want to wait till next week, though, then you can actually buy a copy of Kathy's book, Born to Deliver, and read her full story. You can buy it on Amazon or visit our website, compelledpodcast.com, and we'll include a link to her book in the show notes for this episode. You can also win a free autographed copy of her book by entering the giveaway in our show notes. Just keep scrolling and you'll see the entry form. Again, you can find all of that and more at compelledpodcast.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Compelled Podcast and on Twitter at Compelled Show. Also, please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. That's one of the best ways to help other people find our show. If you enjoyed today's story and want to keep hearing more, here are a couple of ways that you can help out. The first way is to join Compelled as a monthly member starting at $10 a month. As a monthly member of Compelled, you'll receive access to different perks, including behind-the-scenes recordings from our interviews, which is for sure the most popular perk for our members. When I actually sit down and interview guests like Kathy, the actual recording is normally around two hours. And as I recall, I think Kathy's interview was actually three hours. Um, but because there are all kinds of stories and insights that we end up cutting out of the final episode that we release on our podcast, um, there are just all kinds of information that you can listen to on the actual behind the scenes interview. So if you really enjoyed listening to a guest like Kathy today, then you can dive deeper and listen to all of our behind the scenes content when you become a monthly member, not just from Kathy's story, but from all the stories that we have behind the scenes content for. And at our $15 a month membership level, you'll also be invited to an exclusive monthly live stream. Once a month, you'll be sent a link to an invite only video feed where you can meet other compelled listeners you can meet some of the team members from the podcast, and occasionally we might even bring on one of the guests from the show to directly answer questions that you might have. And for a limited time, monthly members receive a free movie from Christian Cinema, another one of our sponsors. Since 1999, Christian Cinema has provided entertainment that inspires families. Christian Cinema has no monthly fees, and they have the largest selection of Christian and family-friendly movies. You can watch a movie today at christiancinema.com and get a free movie by becoming a compelled monthly member at any level. But of course, the biggest benefit of being a monthly member is you're allowing compelled to continue sharing these important stories. You can become a monthly member today by visiting compelledpodcast.com and clicking the link at the top that says become a member. The second way you can support compelled is by sharing this episode with your friends. If you know someone who would be encouraged by Kathy's story, then send it to them and consider sharing this episode on social media. It really makes a difference and helps spread the word about the show. This episode was edited by Zach Fowler. Find him online at zachfowlerimagery.com. Our logo was designed by Josiah Jost. View his work at sidedesign.com. Our website was created by Ben Billups. Follow Ben on Instagram at ben.billups. Our media assistant is Frank Allegrea. Find him on Twitter at the Frank Allegrea. Our music outro is by Ben Jackson and Brian Facchino, and our assistant producer is none other than my wonderful wife, Sarah Hastings. Stay tuned for a sneak peek from next week's episode, which is part two of Kathy Brace's story. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and we'll be back with another compelling story next Tuesday. I just called back and said, hey, this is Kathy Pritchett Brace. I heard that you were trying to get a hold of me and they said yes we were did you have a child on October 19th 1968 yes I did I was so excited I just thought oh my word is it really happening